Good morning and aloha. aloha. Welcome everyone to United Church of Christ. My name is Haley Pacto. I'm going to pass it to Romano and our worship team in leading today's service. We are happy to have you have joined us for this morning's worship, whether you are here in person or joining us online. Let's turn to your neighbor and greet them with a warm welcome. And for those of you watching online, give us a wave or a shot. Lord, our prayer and meditation. Mm-hmm. 
children said that a lot of kids love this part. Yeah. Come up really quick. We got Elijah here. All right. So, uh, come on, Pinky. There we go. Ellie, let's go. Let's go, Matt. Let's go. Okay. All right, kids. Um, today we're going to talk about in the big, in the big adult sermon time. We're going to talk about Genesis one and two. Does anyone know what Genesis one and two talks about? Any guesses? You'll be right. Genesis one. What happens there? LJ. <laughs> <laughs> In the, beginning. in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? This whole big story of creation, right? And before we talk about that, I just want to talk about this whole idea of creation in and of itself, right? If any object that you see was created for a purpose, it's made for something, right? So, for example, if we pick up a hammer, we know that a hammer is designed for what? Camden, what's a hammer for? To build stuff. To build stuff. Right? And we use nails with it, right? So a hammer is specifically designed, right? It's created so that we can kind of jam nails into pieces of wood, put together all that stuff, right? That was its purpose. But imagine if we use the hammer to kind of comb our hair with. It'd be kind of weird, right? That kind of weird, no? Maybe not all of you does that? Okay. So again, I think I think to fully appreciate what something is is for is if we if we do what it was created to do, right? Or for example, the shoe. What's a shoe made for? Any guesses? Natalie, what's a shoe made for? You don't know? You don't know? Yeah, Elijah. A shoe is made for our feet so that we can walk, right? But what if we use our shoes for like gloves? Or what if we eat our shoes? That's kind of weird, right? That's not what it's designed to do. But if we use it for what it's designed for, for our feet, again, we're appreciating it and we're using it for how it was designed. Okay? So in our creation account, the stuff we're going to talk about with the adults is know that you guys, every single one of you guys, are made for a purpose. You guys have a design. Right? We have a creator who is God, and he designed you to love him back and to love other people. If we go outside of that, right, if we become shoes that are used for our feet, it's all messed up, it's all distorted. So we have to go back to what we're designed to do. Ephesians, what's the verse of Ephesians 2.10? For we are God's handiwork. Created Christ Jesus to do good works. Yeah? All right, let's pray. Father, just thank you for this little sweet time where we could um, acknowledge that the kids are part of the church. And uh, Lord, just thank you for this quick word on creation that you have designed us for a purpose, namely to love you and to love other people. Help us to go back to that design and purpose. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can go back. Thank you. All right, so at this time, we'll, uh, we'll pray together. Um, I have a couple uh, submissions here, but does anyone have any ones we want to pray for now that you didn't have get, get a chance to submit? Yeah. Pray for yourself. My son, my son is uh, traveling to Indonesia many hours ago. What's what's your stuff's name? Frank. Frank. I remember Frank traveling overseas and that whole yeah. that whole thing. How crazy it could get. Yeah. Well, that went. Beautiful. Wanna just say thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, we now over here was was a. Uh, Sunday was kind of like a awakening more. I just want to thank you, thank you church, for praying and uh, 
I'm sitting here because I think God wants me to share what I have, whatever I have. So, but I'm so glad I could just sit down and enjoy the morning. Uh, thank you. I feel much better. Um, I, I think Pastor Sahar was at the first first day. I was really happy. Really, I was telling Dr. I don't remember what happened from 6 o'clock till 10, 10, 11 at night. I don't know, I don't even remember singing the song. I don't know what song it is. Yes. <laughs> but I don't remember. But thank you, everybody. Thank you so, so much. He is alive. Amen. Yes. Right. Well, we are definitely happy to see you here. Uh, way healthier than a couple days ago. Okay. You saw it. Yeah, yeah. So continue to pray for the Ramona's family. In fact, keep on praying for Elizabeth for her continued journey of pregnancy for you mothers out there. You know how this heat just is crazy. So just pray for Elizabeth that the baby continues to be healthy. All right, just pray for the whole thing. And then pray for uh, Gianco and uh, I think this is Helen. Uh, pray for, um, he has a broken girl, girl, girl or boy. Is he a boy? Jake was a boy? Girl. Woman, woman, all right. Pray for her healing arm. All right, she broke it. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, again, just thank you for uh, just the opportunity and privilege where we can just a uh, petition of you, Lord. Lord, we come with a few requests. Uh, Lord, again, just pray, just pray for this next hour or so where we get to just hear from you as we get into your word. I just pray that our hearts are just ready to receive whatever gospel you had for us. Uh, Lord, thank you for the Ramones family. It's been a, a strange, trying, hard past few days. Uh, but Lord, as we celebrate that Uncle Edwin is uh, getting healthier, Lord, we lift up Elizabeth and family as uh, they continue to journey along on her pregnancy. We pray and trust that everything will uh, go well. And Lord, we pray for Gieco. Uh, Lord, you know what's going on. She broke her arm. And Lord, again, we just ask for the mercy of healing. Again, God, we thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Partner with them, and we do the 5K with that center. 
And uh, alongside that, we, we raise money uh, for the center. And so if you are interested in that kind of work, right, and donating to them, please let me know. I am gonna shoot money into them um, sometime this week. But uh, that'd be cool if we could kind of maybe start a partnership with New Age Company Church. But again, if you're interested uh, in that type of, in that sort of thing, I can give you more detail, and then we can just kind of coordinate and send money with one check. Uh, also, another order of business. Uh, Alan's not here. Is Jason? Oh, Jason's here. Well, congrats. The Bears won this morning. All right, that's all. Okay. So uh, today, uh, we start something called the Narrative Lectionary. I think the UCC, maybe your church, does the Revised Common Lectionary. So if you, if you go to a more mainline church, that's probably the more common one, Revised Common Lectionary. Today, uh, I want to introduce you guys to something new. It's called the Narrative Lectionary. And if you're unfamiliar with that one, um, what this lectionary does is it takes us uh, from Genesis all the way to a gospel in the New Testament every single year. Genesis all the way through the Old Testament and it will land on Mark. Next year will be Genesis all the way down to, to, to Matthew, Luke, John, all that stuff, right? And what this legendary does, it gives us an opportunity uh, to focus on the major themes and highlighting that this whole thing is actually one big story, right? Uh, and that's very important for us to acknowledge because, admittedly, when you take scripture it, it, and kind of examine it just, just real quick, or you read a verse or two or a book, it seems kind of disjointed. Psalms make sense, Proverbs is cool, I get the gospel. What's first and second things? How does Genesis and Exodus kind of play a role in this larger, big story thing, right? So again, the narrative lecture, it helps us uh, just kind of track along, help us understand, again, this is one big story. Um, this past Wednesday, if you're not busy, you're welcome to come, uh, we have a, a Bible study, and we had some fun, hopefully it was fun, I had fun, but we had some fun just, just taking a few popular verses, and putting them back into context. Because sometimes we take the popular verses and kind of make them mean whatever we want them to mean. But what we did on Wednesday was we took those things, for example, like Philippians 4.13, I mean, do all things through Christ and strengthens me. We put it back into context, and in a very strange way, it takes on a different meaning. And actually, I think it's a better meaning. Right? And so what the what the narrow lecture does, is it do some of that stuff? But it's going to put bigger stories into context. For example, how does the David and Goliath story relate to the gospel? How does the ark relate to the gospel? How does Proverbs relate to the gospel, right? How does First and Second Chronicles relate to the gospel? So again, we're putting the larger chunks into context. Thanks. I hope you guys are excited. I am. But I'm a nerd like that, so... Um, but before we move on, let's pray. Uh, Father, again, we just thank you uh, that you are here with us. And you especially show up in your word. And Lord, we expect that when we dive into your word, you have your word for us. And Lord, again, as I pray every Sunday, we come into these tech, uh, in, into the space with many different contexts, many different circumstances. Maybe the home life is rough, maybe work life is rough. Maybe we had a, a fight going on the way here. But Lord, I just pray that you keep those at bay for a minute that we can hear you right now. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I told the Kiki, um, Genesis begins with a story or the story of creation, right? So if you grew up in Sunday school, you know that's what that is. Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, God said something and the universe and all its contents were created. Genesis 1 gives us an outline, right? Days 1 all the way from 7. Then Genesis 2, it kind of hyper-focuses on the creation of man, right? Adam and Eve and what they're supposed to do in the garden, right? So Genesis 1 
kind of broad outline to more granular, right? Um, in the last 100 years or so, like literally the last 100 years or so, Christians have used this text to try to harmonize both science and the Bible, right? So in the early 20th century, you know, science and rationale were on the forefront. And Christians began to get nervous. Oh man, science is saying this, but the Bible is saying this, what do we do? And so they went back to Genesis 1 and 2 and started creating their thoughts and theology, some theories on how all of this can be synthesized. Right? And so questions like, how old is the earth? Was a big question, right? Is Genesis 1 and 2 literal? If it is, then the earth is somewhere between six and 10,000 years old, right? But if the days in Genesis 1 are not literal, they mean they're more of a framework and it speaks about eras, then maybe the earth could be 4.5 billion years, as some of the scientists say, right? Or questions like, well, when did the dinosaurs run on earth? We're at an eve with the dinosaurs, right? Um, or if, if, the, if the Earth is only 6,000 years old, then how are stars billions of light years away? If Genesis 1 is literal, how was there light before the sun is created? How was there a mist before the earth is oh, and All of these things, right? Is evolution true? How do we think about natural selection and all of this stuff? So I love those kinds of discussions and all the debates that are related to those uh, discussions. That's why I went to seminary. I love this kind of stuff. But unfortunately, those debates, which were supposed to strengthen the church, actually are dividing the church. Oh, you believe in evolution? <laughs> or if you believe in creation? How dare you, right? So we split over these views, and, and we create denominations with them, and we create sub-denominations with, with them, right? So I think that's unfortunate. We have, in a strange way, used the Bible to divide us. All right. So what I'm going to say next might get some people a little nervous, okay? Got to be careful. You got to be careful as well. Okay, I want you to hear me carefully and accurately. And I think when you do that, you'll appreciate this angle. Okay, you guys ready? Okay. Know that the Bible, this, well, this is the hymn okay, but this <laughs> Go to the Bible, and especially the creation account, are you ready for it? Is primarily a theological account, not a scientific or historical one. Okay, hear me closely again. Before I lose you guys, before I get fired, hear, hear me closely. The Bible. Including Genesis 1 and 2 is primarily a theological account, not a scientific or historical. So the key word is primarily, right? It's primarily a theology. I'm not saying that when you read these texts, you can't distill a science or a, or a history from it. I'm not saying you can't do that. But again, the priority when we read this text is there's a theology here that we must learn from. And I think when we do that, of course the categories kind of overlap sometimes, I understand that. But if we keep the purposes in order, when we keep the priority in order as we read these stories, they just make more sense. And I think some of our anxieties as we engage the world kind of lessen. Know that the Bible is a theology, a word about God. Yeah? yeah. All right. Um, now, uh, again, if you want to talk about uh, creation and all this stuff, 
evolution, music. I love talking about it. So please, please talk to me if you want to talk about the granulars. But I, I do want to talk about um, some of the some of the uh, some of the theologies embedded in the text. So in Genesis one, God is called in the Hebrew Elohim. Elohim, right? You've heard this term before. Elohim. And if you know for you Hebrew scholars, Elohim is actually in the plural form. So if you were to translate this like accurately and literally, it would be gods in the beginning. Okay? Because know that the singular form of Elohim is actually El. El. When you add the Ohim or Him, that's plural. So again, the literal translation would be God. Oh, hang on. So does this mean, Pastor Eugene, that there are many gods that created the world? No, that's not what I'm saying. That is not what I'm saying. I am Orthodox. I am, um, I am a Christian exclusivist. I believe there is one God. But why does the text use the plural form here? Well, the Hebrew, just like Spanish or even Tagalog, if you guys know Tagalog, they use the plural form for what? For respect, right? So for example, when I'm talking to someone who speaks Spanish, I can either say, hey, como estas? How are you, right? If he's older than me, right? Or much wiser, which is a lot of people, I can say, como esta usted? And usted is actually a plural form, even though I'm talking to one singular person. Or the God is it? Let's put the God here. Okay, I'm on my own. I don't even speak that for God. So, or, or in the God, I can say, como esta? We all know that. Como esta? Means, hey, what's up? How are you? Now, again, the guy is wiser, much better looking than me, right? I can respect him a little more. I can say, como esta? Cayo. Cayo is plural. So I can say, como esta cayo, like referring to the plurality of you guys. Or if the guy is, is much more respectable than I am, he's an elder, I can say, como esta cayo, right? It's something called the majestic plural or the royal we. When, when you want to respect someone, you refer to them in the plural, the usted, the kayo, the Elohim. So even though God is one, the text respects him, honors the plural majesty by saying, Elohim, you are gods. Does that make sense? So in a sense, Elohim refers to God being king, being God being creator, God being transcendent over every single thing out there. We're giving him that respect. Majestic plural, the royal we. So now if you look at Genesis 2 in our text that we read earlier, there's something very fascinating that happens. So Genesis 1, we have Elohim. Genesis 2, the author adds a word right in front of Elohim. And Genesis, Genesis 2 calls God Lord God. Right? And the Hebrew word behind Lord here, and you guys know it, is Yahweh. So when you read Genesis 1, it's Elohim. Genesis 2 gets more specific. It says Yahweh Elohim. In the English, it's Lord God, capital L O R D, God. And Yahweh, if you remember probably in your previous studies, um, Yahweh is taken from the verb meaning I am, right? Or to be. I am the great I am. That's Yahweh. And so when Yahweh's name, I am, is evoked, it's supposed to remind us that God is eternal. And that God is also ever present. When was God? He's always been God. Who created God? Nobody. He's always been. I am. Yahweh. And so again, when his name is evoked, the effect is this. 
I have always been here. I'm always with creation. I'm always with you. I'm here for you. I've always been here for you. And I'll always, always be here for you. And so, while Genesis 1 talks about, you know, this majestic God, that God is transcendent and sovereign and the creator, which is true and right, know that God is also personal and near. He's present. Yes, he's Elohim, but he's also Yahweh at the same time. Right? So, Genesis 1, God is above creation, totally separate and different from what he's created, spoke everything into existence, spoke the word, and things were created. There's a distance there. But in Genesis 2, we meet Yahweh God, who is right here in our world. And as the text goes on, he plants a garden. He's in the midst of creation. And he's like an artist. He forms and molds humans and animals on the earth. Just like a potter and his clay. Again, in Genesis 2, we learn to know God as Yahweh. The one who says, I am here with you. God is a personal, involved God. He is a gracious God who creates and provides. That's theology. So just think about it. All the, all the fights and the debates we get into, well, day here means 24 literal hours. Well, that, and then maybe it's two creations. That pales in comparison to what the text wants us to know. That God is transcendent and God is also personal. To me, that's a stronger focus than what the church has been fighting about. God is transcendent. He is holy, separate from us, yet He's with us and He's present. When we go on to the creation account, um, something pops up right into our minds as we you know, transport right back into the garden. We think of the Adam and Eve story, right? And right away our minds go with, okay, Adam and Eve, they ate the apple or, you know, the, the mango. Maybe they're in Hawaii, right? They ate the mango. And they sinned, obviously, right? And when we start the story there, right, we think creation, oh, creation, that's what Adam and Eve said. When we start the story there with sin, Right? And the consequential things that happen, right? Where, where God is a just God and he, uh, he has to exact justice on sin, right? If we start there, then God, we kind of distort God to, to be like this authoritarian, right, evil guy who wants to punish people all the time and every time. And again, know that God. Correcting the sin is not the starting point of this big theme story here, right? The starting point is a gracious God who creates man, breathes life into him, and placing him into the garden where everything is available. The big Bible story starts with the gracious God who provides. And with all that, uh, he gives humanity an awesome partnership, right? Adam and Eve, they complement one another. Like Adam couldn't find a complementary partner in the animals. And God created a co-equal mutual partnership. It's just great. God is at the center. There's fruit all over the place. He's playing with, it sounds like awesome. And among all the million allowances God gives Adam and Eve, he just gets one prohibition. Just one. Adam and Eve, you can eat the mango. You can eat the Chico out there and the home eats. You can eat the jackfruit. You can play with the, the mongooses. You can play with the chickens. You can play with all these things. The millions of things you can do. 
You can go to the North Shore and go surfing. Everything. Just one thing. That tree over there, I preserved that for something. Do not touch that. So God gave access to humanity to everything minus one. And not only did he give access to us, uh, uh, not only did he give everything to humans, access to everything creation, he gave them himself. God gave humanity himself. Yet again, we think God is a restrictive beast for barring one tree. Again, in reality, he gave them more than enough. Every other tree, every other animal, and most importantly, himself. God, from the get-go, is a gracious God. He says in verse 15, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it to work it. And the Lord commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the, in, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Just one. Just one thing. The, the Adam and Eve had everything that everything that all of us desire. Awesome weather, healthy food, and then chapter two happens. We know where this goes. Adam and Eve do the one thing out of millions they're not supposed to do, and that brings a curse on them and creation. And then life and creation starts to distort. Everything's odd whack here now. Life begins to be hard. And from this moment forward, this is how all of humanity experiences life. One, things don't go our way all the time, right? In the garden, weeds and thorns grow, finally. What is going on with this? Work is hard, right? You sweat and toil, verse 19. There's pain and disease. Our experience of God, our fellowship with God is, is broken because of our sinfulness. And our experience of one another. Between Adam and Eve, the rest of humanity is also affected because of our sin. Everything gets distorted. So everything we do today, we, you know, we're trying to reverse the curse of all that, right? Everything we do today is trying to reverse the effects of sin, right? We're, we're trying to go back to the garden time, right? Easy work. Who doesn't want an easy job? See? No, okay, I, I want a hard job. Long hours, bodily, no one wants that. I want to live in a place where it's cold all the time. Nobody wants that. We all want good weather. That's what we essentially try to do. We want a good job, and by good, I mean one that we can flourish and feel good about. All of us want a job that puts food on the table. And in many ways, we want easy. That's not a bad thing. To make jobs easier is not a bad thing. Our bodies want to be by creation. What's better? Being in an office or being by the beach? Be honest. Beach, right? And I think that all speaks to the fact that we're, we're created originally to be part of creation. We're all trying to go back to the original design. Our bodies feel that tension. Now, Hawaii's close. Don't get me wrong, but maybe that's why that example isn't hit as strong. But if you come from Chicago, it's like, yeah, I want something better than this. But you guys experience good weather already, right? But again, the, the, the life grind is again to, to, is to try to restore our relationship back with God and with other people. If you notice, know 
That's what the Ten Commandments are designed to do. To bring back to God and bring back to people. Right? Have only one God, don't have any idols. Don't steal, don't commit adultery. Those are all things to mend relationship with God the divine and humans. It's full communion. Again, sin destroys both of those relationships. So sin destroys fellowship with God and neighbor. So the law steers you away from sin so that you can restore this full communion. In other words, if you want to have it like it was in the original garden, do not sin. Don't sin anymore. Be perfect. Be holy. Obey the law. Now that's a tough word. Is that possible? Of course it's not. Right? Again, except Uncle David, he's almost right there. But for the, for the rest of us, we all fail and we all sin, right? And you should know by now, none of us can fulfill the law perfectly. Which puts us at, which, which, which gives us a catch-22. To have a perfect life, obey the law. But none of us can obey the law perfectly and righteously all the time. To reverse the curse of the fall, we must fulfill the law, but we cannot fulfill the law. And I think you guys know where I'm going with this. Now you see how the garden account points us forward to something better. Something restorative. Again, when God created the universe, loving and gracious, he put Adam and Eve in a context where they could flourish. He lovingly gave himself to them in pure, 100% fellowship. What prohibition? Out of the million allowances. And then, they fall short. Now here's the thing. Did this change God's loving and gracious posture or disposition? It did not. It did not. And we had to do some work Again, to uh, reclaim who God is. Again, we read Genesis 3, oh, God is an evil God. He is so angry, he's so mad. Sinners in the hands of, a, of an angry God. But if you read the story a little bit more closely and carefully, why was Adam and Eve who messed up? It was God who was moving towards them. Seeking after that still. And we see a loving God attempting to restore them. It's beautiful. And so that's a word for us. While we are frail, while we are imperfect, while we're disloyal, while we're unfaithful creatures who cannot fulfill the law, He provided someone who can. Himself. Himself. In chapter 3, again, we have Adam and Eve's sin. We have the, the, consequ the consequential judgment on that. They try to hide. And God's like, Adam, where are you? I think, I, I think, I think you know, again, depending on how you grew up, or how your parents were, we kind of read this as, Adam, where are you? But again, if you start at the starting point, for God is a gracious, loving God who loves people. I think it's Adam. Where are you? Why are you hiding? And so again, we have a God walking in and through the garden, trying to find a sinful couple. He finds them and he clothes their nakedness. He pursues and provides for them still. You see, that might be a, a, a different capturing of, of God. And then in 3.15, again, this, this again starts to shape how this is a, the big, or how, how this story is part of the big story. He says in 3.15, this is also called the, the pre-gospel. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, signs of the devil here, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and he will strike his heel. 
He's saying, hey, devil, there's going to be a time. Well, yeah, you might kind of win. You might crucify somebody for it. But you know what? He's going to eventually destroy you. That's Jesus the Christ. So you just wait. So we get the gospel right away in Genesis 3.15. The devil, you might have won a little bit right now, but wait because the story does not end. So again, God speaks in a very cryptic but prophetic word here that points to Jesus. God in the flesh would come and fully destroy sin. That is a loving and gracious God. We messed up, yet God is the one who's pursuing us. We all want a better work, right? We all want a sense of worth. We want a sense of identity. We all want meaning. In order to do so, we must attach ourselves to the one who can restore all things. When we attempt to make the world ours or decide how our lives are going to unfold, we make the same mistake as Adam and Eve. But when we cling out to God, through a surrender to Jesus Christ, we make real moves to go back to how it was in the garden. Okay, so why do let me recenter us here? God is the creator. He's transcendent, holy, and righteous, sinless. Yet, he is ever present with us, even, even, and despite our sinfulness, is with us. We're sinful and, dis and distort our purpose and our design, yet God is also an ever-present, personal God. He loves us. He's gracious. He's loving. We are sinners in the hands of a loving God. So despite our sin, all of you guys are sinners, right? He is, he is pursuing you and me. Relentlessly, unconditionally saying, come to me. Desiring and calling you to come to him through his son to restore our purpose. Let us pray. Father, sometimes we forget that the story begins with your love and grace and overflowing from that is creation. And Lord, sometimes we jump right to the simple story of how humanity fails. But Lord, again, the story begins with a loving and gracious God. And then when humanity does sin, you don't leave. You pursue Adam and Eve. You, you pursue us. You clothe us, Lord. You love us. Lord, I pray that all of us here respond to that God. Lord, help us to give our lives to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 
So as I was listening to, you know, Pastor EJ's sermon, and I know not all of you really know know me enough to know like backstories and things, but this song here, It Is About God, always brings me back to a certain memory of just thinking about all my different failures and thinking about how God is so good. And so I know that as Pastor EJ had mentioned, you know, on Sunday service, we come with many different things, many things on our shoulders. And one of which that I know I always carry is being a mother. And I can think of all the different things in which I, you know, fail as a mother. And I'm just so thankful for God's goodness um, of recent in between jobs, just giving me the time to spend with them. And if you know me from last year, I had no time for anything. Not even to breathe or think. And I'm just, just thankful for my God's goodness in that. And so I just want to share where the song kind of brings me whatever I should be
We see the benediction. And the God who created the heavens and the earth, who formed you with love and care, fill you with purpose and peace. Go now in his grace, knowing that the Creator walks with you, guiding you in all the good works he has prepared for you to do. Amen.